Hello, everybody. Welcome. The uh, webinar is going to start in a few minutes. Uh, we're just going to wait for everyone else to arrive and we're going to start punctually at 10 a.m. Central European Summer Time. So if you're already in there, please, uh, please get comfortable. We will uh, we'll be with you soon. Okay, just going to start in a couple of minutes, so bear with us. Okay. All right. Uh, hello to uh, Gautam, who posted into the questions. Good morning to you. <laughs> okay, I believe that's 10 o'clock. So, uh, so let's make a start. Hello. Welcome, everybody. And good morning. It's a pleasure to once again, welcome you to an online panel discussion hosted by CBI. Today, we're going to be looking at the opportunities in food tourism. Now, before we dive into the session, uh, let's just do some introductions, get to know each other a little better. Uh, I'm James Turner from uh, Black Spiral Design. I'll be your moderator, host and question master today. I've been working in tourism development across the UK, Africa, Europe and beyond for nearly 18 years now. And I have to admit to being a committed food tourist, uncovering the flavours, traditions and the differences in food around the world is one of the main reasons that I travel. Um, and it's one of the first things I look for when I arrive anywhere. Food is so important. It's far more than just sustenance. It can and should be the core of any great visitor experience. Now, today's session is going to explore exactly those themes as we look in depth at the opportunities in the food tourism market. We're going to be asking key questions like what makes a great food tourism experience, how we can best sell or promote our food experiences and plenty more. We've got lots of examples, ideas, and inspiration for you all, all ably delivered by our star-studded panel of global experts, who we're gonna meet shortly. Uh, we're confident you'll each be able to take away some practical advice that you can use to make your own amazing food experiences even more effective. Now, uh, as you might have noticed, we are using GoToWebinar today. Um, just a couple of key kind of bits of information housekeeping before we begin. Um, some of you may be familiar, but here's the important bits. Remember, you're all in listen only mode, which means you can't, we can't hear or see you and you can't hear or see each other. But if you want to interact with us, you can do, but you have to do, through, do so through the GoToWebinar control panel. 
Now, if you're coming in on a desktop, it will look somewhat like the one over on the right of the screen here. If you're coming on a mobile, it will look slightly different, but you'll have similar tabs. The important things to note, if you're having problems with the audio, dialing in over the internet, if you click on the option to dial in by phone, you can join the webinar that way and go to webinar will take you through it. Uh, that phone call will be toll free or local tariff at the very most, so you don't have to worry about excessive costs. If you want to ask us any questions, there is a question tab, which some of you have been using already. So good morning to everyone who's posted in there. And yes, we will indeed enjoy the webinar. Um, so please do keep asking questions throughout the session. The more of you ask questions, the more we've got to, to look at. We love difficult questions. It's all great learning for everybody. So please do ask some questions and put us all on the spot. Um, there are no handouts in this session, so you don't have to worry about the handouts tab. Um, there are going to be a couple of polls that will pop up, but you don't have to do anything special when those arrive. Just interact with them, vote as you wish. And just a reminder, we are going to be recording this session, so um, we'll provide a copy of it along with all the notes, the slides and everything to each of you guys afterwards, so you don't have to worry about taking notes on everything today. Now, I'd like to start off by inviting Jeanette from CBI just to say a few words to get us started. Now, Jeanette, are you there? Yes. Hi, James. Okay. Good morning to so, you. Good morning, Jeanette. Now, sadly, Jeanette is invisible this morning because her webcam is no longer functioning. So uh, it'll have to be voice only from Jeanette. So over to you, Jeanette. Yes, James. Thank you. And what uh, uh, this what an unfortunate uh, thing today, because I this morning I just did my hair very nicely which you cannot see now. So I'm very We can just imagine, that. it's fine. We'll, we'll, we'll just oh, imagine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, James. Anyway, <laughs> good. A warm welcome to all of you, all of the participants. We had a very good number of registrations today, so we're very happy uh, from all different countries all over the world, and that's always so nice to see. Good. Um, these are challenging times. I remember last year, end of 2020, and we were doing a series of webinars as well. And I was talking and I was saying, look, next year the markets will most probably reopen. But it was wishful thinking because they didn't. And we're now one year later and, and really I feel like I feel like last year. Also, my message is the same, because last year I said the markets will reopen, the tourists will come back. And now it's the same message. Yes, they will come back, because one day there will be a time when we will control the pandemic. And then we still want to travel. So what you see with natural disasters, pandemics or anything disturbing this very volatile tourism market it's always been that the tourists comes the tourists are coming back so we hope in 2022 and the hope is there because of the vaccinations and that brings down the covid numbers there will be a new surge in winter time because of uh, of the flu season and that also uh, uh, makes things with covid a little bit less controllable um, but it will come back in the meantime, what do you need to do? You need to survive, find other business, go for your domestic tourism, uh, see what you can do and survive and be ready when they come. Fortunately, even for the long haul destinations, there is still bookings going on. These are small groups, families, friends, they travel in their own bubble. So they come out of the airplane, go into the safari bus, for example, and you can drive them to these further of destinations. Um, where do they book? They book with the tour operators who they can feel they trust in their COVID measures and sanitation measures. measures. And the new trend is very visible to go for unforgettable experiences in far flung locations. The potential tourists have been saving their money for two years now, and they want to make sure to check off their bucket list with unforgettable experiences. So 
if you want to have some share of this market, some piece of this really tasty pie, then it's better to be prepared. So what do you need to offer? How do you get prepared? Your quality needs to be really good. Um, so the trend for the unforgettable experiences is very suitable for the food tourism market. If you are able to combine the exquisite flavors of food with the mesmerizing flavors of your destination, and you are able to get this message across, you're in business. So that's why CBI is organizing this seminar. We did do a research, so that's online. You can read all about the trends and the figures and the data supporting everything going to be said during this webinar. And today we have a panel to tell you firsthand about the practical things and how to develop this product, but especially what to focus on. What's in the mind of this European tourist who will come back, hopefully next year. Okay, after this very small introduction and hope, I hope, a little bit about CBI. Uh, my name is Jeanette Scherpenzeel. I'm the CBI program manager responsible for the tourism sector account. CBI is a Dutch government development program and we believe in development by developing business. And we focus on small and medium companies to strengthen their economic, social and environmental sustainability through exports to Europe or in the case of the tourism sector by getting in more tourists from Europe who are in the segment for sustainable tourism and spend their money locally for local impact. Good. We believe sustainable tourism can flourish when you look at the demand and when you prepare high quality products targeted to the preferences of your specific client base, which is very much in line with the new reality, going for authentic once in a lifetime experiences, traveling in small groups, realizing the wow factor for your clients. Good. Then, very much in line with today, I will close my introduction, give it back to James, and uh, wish you all a very good session. Back to you, James. Thank you, Jeanette. I think that's ably set everything up, um, and I certainly echoed some of the key messages we want to get across today. You know, we understand this is difficult times, but there's so much you can do. There's so much potential for things that can still make a difference. So thank you, Jeanette. Now, uh, without further ado, let's meet our expert panel. Uh, could I invite them to join me on screen, please? Let's see if this works. Oh, look. Hey, look, they're all here. Fantastic. OK, first of all, it's always a pleasure to welcome back our resident tourism expert, Alison Berg from Acorn Tourism here in the UK. Um, Alison, could you introduce yourself and help everyone to get to know you a little better? Great. Good morning, James. Uh, great to be back with you and uh, with Esther and Tony this morning. Um, so my name's Alison Berg. I'm the director of Acorn Tourism Consulting, which I co-founded 20 years ago. Uh, since then, we've worked with about 80, 80 in 80 countries around the world. Uh, we work very much with destinations, helping them to develop their tourism economies. Um, and we work a lot with developing destinations in Africa, been working recently in Zambia, currently working in Sierra Leone, also in Central America, working um, in Belize and currently with uh, to commu two communities high in the Andes, looking at how they can use their biodiversity, their local produce that they're actually growing in the forests to develop their tourism expertise and helping them with their cuisine. Um, I'm also working closely on the uh, CBI's programme in Jordan, um, and I've been one of CBI's tourism experts for about the last 10 years and work very specifically as well in market research. So I've been writing um, the tourism, food tourism reports amongst um, many of the other niche tourism reports that are on the CBI website. Wow, thank you very much, Alison. Yeah. Uh, secondly, I'm very pleased to welcome Tony Thorne, who is the Managing Director of Wilderness Explorers, who's joining us all the way from Australia this, well, actually this evening. Good evening, Tony. Thank you for being with us. Could I just ask you to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you, James. Uh, my name is Tony Thorne. As James mentioned, I'm the uh, Managing Director and Founder of Wilderness Explorers. I am in Australia at the moment, but I spend my time between here in the UK and Guyana. 
So uh, we're a destination management company. We're based in Guyana, but we also operate in uh, Suriname, French Guyana and Caribbean. So we tend to specialize in nature, adventure and cultural tourism. And we also include a lot of uh, food based experiences in our tours. But personally, I really enjoy creating new activities and tours. And over the last few years, uh, food themed experiences have become a really important part of our trips which is perhaps helped by the fact that, that I love food and food travel in particular. And uh, so that has influenced my, my enjoyment in creating those sort of trips. And I look forward to sharing some of our stories today and hearing what uh, the people listening in today might be doing in their areas around food tourism as well. Thanks, James. Great, great stuff, Tony. It's nice to find a kindred spirit. Excellent. Um, and finally, uh, I'm very excited to welcome our, our final panelist, uh, panelist. Esther Giacomoni, I hope I've pronounced that right. I apologise. Thank you. <laughs> no, no, it Esther, was perfect. Thank you. Esther is the head of marketing and partnership at Eat With, and who I believe is joining us from Milan today. Uh, no, I'm from Paris. Ah, Paris yeah, yeah. today. Still <laughs> yes. very nice. Welcome, Esther. Uh, again, perhaps just a few words just to introduce yourself to the of audience. Of course, of course. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, as James said, I mean, I'm the head of partnership and marketing at Eat With. Eatwit is the biggest community in the world for food experiences with local hosts. We are operating right now in more than 100 countries and our mission is bringing people together to food. So I think it's really a nice mission for a company because I mean we strongly believe that uh, um, the table is the original social network as we said. So uh, we want really people to discover culture and meeting new people thanks to and joining together a food experience. So I will be here today to talk more about the distribution and the best channel that you can use in order to distribute your food experiences. So I'm also a foodie, of course, and I am a kind of a <laughs> digital nomad <laughs> because okay. I'm working like from all over the world, basically. So that's why I mean, today I'm in Paris, but I will be in London next week. So uh, we are really on the field. So that's why I mean, we are traveling a lot to develop and also to distribute food experiences. OK, fantastic. Thank you, Esther. And thank you, everybody. Um, I'm really excited that all of you are foodies. Um, and I'd just like to kick things off by just asking you very quickly. What would each of you say is the most memorable food travel experience you've had? Doesn't have to be the best. What was the most memorable food travel experience you've had? Uh, Alison, can I come to you first? Well, that's a tough one. Um, like all of you, I'm a great foodie, um, great love food with my travels and uh, had some you know, really great experiences. But I think one of the most memorable was uh, just about six months before lockdown. We were out in Jamaica. I was there with the family and staying with some Jamaican friends who said that they had been trying to book a place on this uh, high seas raft for a seafood dinner um, that had opened okay. up a few months before. Um, and yeah, we ended up getting pulled out on a bamboo raft to a Rasta fisherman who'd been out catching lobster that, that morning and and then cooked it up i mean it was the absolute archetypal food tourism experience there was a bit of adventure there was all the local sounds of and smells of rasta and reggae and just delicious <laughs> fresh lobster so um it really ticked all the boxes sounds sounds experience. unbelievable uh esther what about you most memorable food experience for me actually it was nepal nepal is okay. one of my favorite countries and uh, of course i was not there for food tourism, I would say. So it was a bit of a surprise to, I mean, try dal bat. It is one of their, yeah, yeah their national dish. And yeah. it was really amazing. We were up in the mountains in Arnapurna. So imagine having like uh, with our guides and people, local people having a, ensuring a dal bat together. So it was really amazing and one of my best experience of food travel, I would say. Fantastic, fantastic. Uh, Tony, I'm going to guess you're going to talk about Guyana, but <laughs> well, yeah, I've been traveling the world for 40 years, but I will give you a, an example in Guyana. It's very traditional in number in the communities. If they're eating, they will share with you. And we were doing reconnaissance for a new trip up a river, visiting villages we've never been to before. And we happened to enter one village and we were offered from the pot. And you know, you don't say no in those circumstances. Of course you eat. And we were a little surprised to find out we were eating a roasted monkey, which was a bit unexpected. And uh, okay. we did uh, actually have a press conference after that trip where we mentioned this and it, it even went on to, to national news and the, and the, the cartoonist Lamp 
pooned us about uh, eating monkey, which wasn't the, what we were going to do for tourists, but he didn't quite understand the culture in his own country, I don't think. But, and that's one of the things I love about the Indigenous culture is just their preparedness to share. And if you're willing to join in, you can have some great experiences. Okay. All right. I'm not sure how to follow that up, but okay. Thanks, Tony. Um, <laughs> all right. Good stuff. Right. Well, I hope maybe that's got your taste buds interested in this session. Um, anyway, let's get started. Let's dive in and try and sort of frame the subject a little bit. Um, Alison, could I ask you to just lead us through some of the key points to do with the food tourism market and kind of just answers the question, you know, what is food tourism? What does it mean? What, what are we talking about? Great, thanks, James. And yeah, I'm just going to give you a run through some of the sort of key things that key messages and topics that are in the report. Um, so you can find those um, on the CBI website in a bit more detail. But as you say, first of all, let's look at, you know, what is food tourism? Uh, this quote uh, that I hope you can see on the screen um, is from Eric Wolf, who's the president of the World Food Travel Association. Um, and he's described food tourism as the pursuit and enjoyment of unique and memorable food and drink experiences, both near and far. And, you know, I think that sums up, you know, what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, but thinking about, you know, what does that actually mean in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the types of experiences that you can have. Um, there's a whole range of types of food um, that you can, food experiences that you can develop both as a tour operator or within a destination. Um, local producer and culinary experiences um, are key to this. So there could be quite specialist ones, food and wine trails or tastings, visiting local producers, whether it's uh, people, that, whether it's oil, olive oil producing, cheese making, tea picking, there's a whole range of local producers um, that can create food experiences. Uh, there's cooking classes that you can do either in person or online. Um, and, you know, quite high level culinary experiences. But there's also a really key element to food tourism, which is about sharing experiences, very much about having meals with local people. If you're staying in a homestay, preparing meals with your hosts, if you're a small manufacturer, you can create a little food museum around what you're producing. Um, this one here on this photo of the Cotton Tree Food, uh, Cotton Tree Chocolate Factory is in southern Belize and Toledo and just shows people how they can make, they make small batch chocolate. Um, it's very hands on and of course you can buy the chocolate at the end of your trip. And, local food is really key to what people are enjoying and you can do street food tours um, food festivals created in many destinations uh, farmers markets or these some really famous well-known food destinations like the night food stalls that you find in the center of marrakesh in morocco that really attract thousands of tourists uh, to come and eat the local food a lot of regions have developed food tours, food maps, like this regional cuisine of Mexico, um, where they're showing tourists the different specialities and you can get in different regions and, and the different types of food that you can eat there. Um, and you could have all sorts of food tours, whether it's sort of regional or whether it's a gourmet experience, vegan tours, or looking at the local tea or coffee shops. So very importantly, you know, why invest in creating what food tourism experiences? Um, the simple answer is that it's good business. It's good business for you, and it's also very good business for your destination. More and more tourists want to try out local food in the places that they visit, and you'll often find that they choose a place because it's got a great reputation for good food. I think James you know, highlighted that earlier. He chooses places he wants to go and where he's going to eat well. It's also very much a growing market. In recent years, it's become one of the most important and valuable tourism niches. And why is that? I mean, largely because everybody spends money on food and beverages, and that makes up a significant part of the budget of every tourist. Um, probably on average, tourists spend around 25% of their budget on food and drink, and this can range up to 35% in more expensive destinations or maybe around 15 to 20% in uh, 
less costly destinations, but it's a really key element of what people are spending. Everybody has to eat and drink. Um, it also attracts um, people on the basis of giving them a really satisfying food experience. Um, around 80% or more than 80% of le le leisure travellers say that food and drink experiences have a really big influence on the satisfaction of their trip and make them more likely to return to a destination in future. And in terms of your destination and where you're, what you're bringing to your local communities, it's a key element of bringing money locally. Apart from all inclusive, you know, people go out and spend money. They spend it in restaurants, they spend it in festivals, they spend it with local producers if they're going to, to, to taste things. So it's an important in its contribution to the local economy. The other very important element of food tourism is that it helps tourists to really understand the local culture about 80% or more of leisure tourists say that food and drink really helps them in that understanding of the people they're meeting. It creates cross-cultural connections, it can educate travellers about the local culture and really that helps to preserve local traditions and local heritage because people are developing those traditions and helping them to create an income from those traditions. So why target Europe? Um, well, first of all, Europe is one of the largest markets for food tourism. It accounts for about 35% of the global market. And food is very much embedded in a lot of these European cultures. People love cultural experiences. They're getting more and more exposed to food through social media, through food tourism um, and food cookery programs that you're finding on the television. And Europe is one of the biggest markets. It's a relatively prosperous, well-educated tourists that are interested in culinary experiences and traveling to developing countries. So the biggest markets you're probably looking at are France, Italy, the German speaking countries, including Austria, um, Spain, the Netherlands, and of course the UK are all very big markets to, to think about targeting. And in addition, these are countries that have got the highest COVID vaccination rates. And you know, as Jeanette said, there's a really pent up demand for people to start traveling again. So what are these European food tourists looking for? Well, they want locally produced, authentic food, and they want to discover new culinary experiences. So they want great great food experiences that has a story behind it they really want to understand the history and the links with the local culture and the photograph here is in colombia i mentioned that i've been working there with communities there and this is a trip to a local fishing village where the tradition is that you lay out all the fish and the whole um, village comes and eats after a great catch and we were um, lucky enough to have a very fishy breakfast there and um, Tony is going to talk to you a lot more about how you can create these great experiences in a moment. Um, but one of the key elements of, of great food and experiences is that they're fantastic to promote on social media. Um, and they're very visual and they're great stories to tell. Another key trend uh, that's very important to be aware of is the growing importance of sustainability um, in all aspects of European life. And um, it's and with that is a growing interest in sustainable food. Uh, it's particularly strong in Italy, Germany and Austria, and it's particularly driven by the younger generations. So for Europeans, sustainable food is really talking about food that's produced locally, and that has a low environmental impact and that generates a fair income for farmers. And uh, one of the main barriers for Europeans is in eating well and eating sustainably is that food tends to be, that type of food tends to be a lot more expensive. And there's also a lack of information about where that sustainable food comes from and where the ingredients um, you know, uh, come from. So it's a real opportunity for you to look to create food experiences that use local produce and that you can promote one on your website and you can tell the story about where that food comes from and the interesting local traditions and the people involved in making it. And this local farmer 
you know, takes people on a tour to pick the coffee beans and then shows them how it's manufactured and, and can give them um, coffee and their homegrown coffee. But however much Europeans like to think that they can go local, they also have very high expectations of health and safety and hygiene. They're used to very strict regulations around food safety, and they need to be reassured that, reassured that there's effective local cleanliness protocols in place. Uh, they're also obviously very conscious about COVID and having been very hard hit by COVID in Europe, uh, they want to know what safety measures are in place. So your homepage of a website is a good place to provide a prominent link uh, to what you do about your COVID procedures. And this example here is of um, a European tour operator, Family Foodie Escapes. And as you can see, they've got a very clear link right at the top of their homepage to coronavirus and the update of what they're doing about that. So are all food tourists the same? Well, there's a lot of research that's been done into the different type of food tourists that there are, but very broadly, there are two, two types of food tourists. The largest market, are those that are very broadly orientated towards food. They tend to be driven by the younger tourists, the under 40s, the millennials and Gen X, which is sort of 25, um, 50, sort of about 18 up to 25, um, and the growing number of, of millennials. Uh, they're, they're interested in adventure, they're interested in culture, and they're interested in food, and what they want those broad experiences. They can be quite budget conscious and necessarily got got huge budgets, but they love street food and and they love cooking with locals. They love the farmers markets. Uh, they're concerned about sustainability. Uh, there's a lot of interest in vegan food these days and they're looking for specialist uh, menus and they're also very much driven by social media. So if you can get one really good social media post from a high profile influencer, can really significantly change uh, the popularity of your destination. The other type of main group is the smaller group, but uh, very important gastronomic tourists. They're far more orientated towards luxury. They tend to be a bit, old, bit older, they're very well educated, they're well traveled, and they're looking for much more highly curated um, VIP type experiences, such as meals in a chef's home, meeting their family, and um, so they're high spenders, then they're pre prepared to spend money on a really great personalized experience. And um, so really there's no need to cut costs there. They, they want everything to be perfect and that's what's most important to them. In terms of how you can reach these tourists, uh, there are three or four way, key ways, and I know that um, of distributing your food tourism product, and I know Esther's gonna talk about that in more detail in a moment. Um, but just to give you an idea of the key distribution channels, there are direct sales, either through your website or having walk-ins or through online. Um, this example is a fantastic women's community uh, that's based in, in Belize. Uh, they're a family of, of women, sisters and mother who've created a, a great experience and they promote that purely on Facebook. Um, and again, very busy. Um, but you have to book quite well in advance. In terms of tour operators, you can get, there are a few really specialist tour operators that focus on food, not a huge number of them, but you can find in your own country, you might find a really specialist uh, tour operator such as Taste Belize, uh, which focuses on food and culture tours in Belize, targeting the FIT market, the independent travelers who get to Belize and want to book specialist experiences. In the outbound markets in Europe, there are a few specialist uh, food tour operators such as Gourmet on Tour. Again, they're, they're really combining those culinary experiences uh, with that a sense of adventure um, and culture. Um, the biggest market in terms of the outbound European tour operators is probably the general adventure uh, market. Uh, adventure tour operators who are selling uh, adventure tours and increasingly are building in um, foodie experiences. And I love this description that Intrepid Travel have got on their website when they're describing their tours. 
These are real world experiences with a foodie twist. One part culture, one part adventure, and three parts delicious. From bite-sized trips to gastron gastronomic odysseys will get you munching, crunching, sipping and slurping, just like the locals. And I think that's a great description of you know, how a European tour operator is targeting that market um, that want that adventure and culinary experience. Um, and then there are the OTAs, the online travel agents. Again, I know Esther is going to talk about this in a lot more detail, but you get the specialist online tour operators that really are just focusing on food experiences, eat with, traveling food, secret food tours. Um, and you also find the general tour operators, the general OTAs, such as Airbnb, TripAdvisor and Viator, are increasingly focusing on selling food tours and experiences as well. So that's a quick overview of what's in the report. So I hope it's given you a, a sort of overview of what uh, Tony and then Esther are going to talk about. And I think Jeanette will go into more detail about the report, but you can find uh, the two food tourism reports on CBI's uh, website. So thank you very much. Thank you, Alison. That's uh, very nicely set things up for everyone else. Uh, brilliant, all I can say, giving us an idea of what exactly we're talking about. Um, and hopefully, as you're going to see, all of our other speakers are going to expand on some of the points that Alison's made. So, um, so yeah, good start. Um, OK, just before we dive into getting hold of our panellists, I'd like to have a little bit of audience participation. Uh, we've got a quick poll we'd just like to put up for you, just to kind of give us a bit of an idea of what kind of food products you or what kind of food experiences you're developing or what kind of food experiences you have. So I'm going to put a poll up. Very simple question. We want to know whether you currently have any dedicated food experiences as part of the tours that you either provide yourselves or the ones that you promote. So the answers are, do you have dedicated food experiences? So things like tasting sessions, cooking courses, uh, you know, food at home with, with local people. Do you offer food experiences, but only part of, as part of something else? So for example, if you're doing a cycling tour, you include you know, food as part of that. Are you currently developing some because you don't have any at the minute? Do you not have any? And you have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, I'm just going to pop that poll up. That poll's now open. You should be able to vote on that one. Uh, please do. Like I said, we're just interested to see, really we're interested is do you have any really dedicated food experiences where food is the star of the show? If not, do you have any that are include food, but the focus is something else, whether that's cultural, adventure, you know, whatever it happens to be. Okay. It's going to give people a couple minutes just to vote on those. If you haven't voted, please do. OK, that's pretty good. OK, I'm going to close that poll now. Last chance to vote. That will do. OK, let's have a look at those results. Well, as you can see, it's a pretty even split. It's quite encouraging that how many of you have dedicated food experiences, and I'm hoping you're going to be able to take away from this session some things to either improve those experiences or certainly to enable you to kind of get those experiences to peak to your customers more readily. For those that you are developing some, this is absolute ground zero for you guys. Please take away all of the things that our guest speakers are going to be talking about today. So, yeah, or those of you who don't, certainly think about it after this. OK, thank you, everybody. Very, very kind of you to share with us. OK, let's move things on in earnest uh, and consider how we could develop or create a great food experience and what it takes to do so. Fortunately, we're joined by Tony Thorne from Wilderness Explorers. Tony, are you there? Yes, I am. Fantastic. OK, uh, just before Tony starts, I'd just like to remind everyone, please do ask questions in the uh, in the question section. Uh, we'd love to put a load of like questions to Tony, you know, what monkey tastes like. Um, what exactly like the chicken, cost? of course <laughs> don't answer it now you know or you know what exactly was the cartoon that was lampooning him because we're quite interested in that so yes please do keep asking questions we're going to get to some of those just after Tony spoke so uh, Tony I'm going to ask you the big difficult question you know how do we make a really good food tourism experience what goes into it what do we need to do to really make a success of it all right, good. Thanks, James. And, uh, and Alison, thank you for your uh, presentation. And uh, a lot of the points you've made there, I'm going to go into you know, some detail with uh, what we've been doing. 
So I just need to get rid of this screen so I can see my own screen. There we go. Uh, so uh, hello to everyone out there and thank you for joining us on the webinar today. I'm really happy to be able to share a few ideas and experiences from our journey with uh, food tourism in Guyana. To start with, I want to explain a little bit about Guyana as its location and history is an important factor in how the unique cuisine uh, developed in the country. So Guyana is often mistaken for being an African country, and I suspect many people mix it up with Ghana. But in fact, it sits on the, on the, sorry, the northeastern shoulder of South America between Venezuela and Suriname. So South America was largely colonized by Spanish and Portuguese, but this little corner of the continent is fought over by the English, Dutch and French, and they all controlled Guyana at one point in, uh, during history. The tropical climate, fertile ground, uh, means that Guyana was a perfect place for agriculture, in particular sugar, which was such an important and wealthy crop at that time. Guyana's original inhabitants are indigenous people, and the country has nine different uh, indigenous groups or tribes, and uh, the area was cultivated for sugar, and uh, sugar requires a, a large or large amount of manpower, and this unfortunately led to hundreds of thousands of people forcibly taken from Africa and put into slavery to work the uh, crops. When uh, slavery was finally abolished, uh, they were replaced by indentured laborers, primarily from uh, India, Portugal, and China. So this colonial history mixed with indigenous culture has had a, a, a real lasting impact and influence on today's uh, unique Guyanese cuisine. For example, uh, Medici, a great example of a traditional dish that has its roots in Africa and was brought to Guyana with the slaves and adapted to what was available to them locally within Guyana. Likewise, the indentured laborers uh, from Portugal, they introduced garlic pork which has today become a traditional Guyanese dish uh, used throughout the nation. And it's certainly one of my favorite dishes uh, in Guyana, uh, regardless of whether it's Christmas or not. So the food of the country is a wonderful way to understand the history and culture of the country and the people. Travelers generally have always been interested in the, in the local cuisines of countries they visit. And over the past few years, uh, the food scene's really emerged and grown as travelers seek out immersive experiences allow them to go under the skin of the country and food is an excellent pathway to understand the local culture. According to the Food Travel Monitor, food tourism adds 25% economic benefit to a destination. So this is, um, I think, clarifying that the point that Alison made a bit earlier. You know, 53% of leisure travellers are also food travellers and 63% of millennials are also seeking socially responsible restaurants. So food tourism is an important element in global tourism. Taking a simple city tour and adding a food element changes the experience. It's not as simple as just adding a meal at a local restaurant, but weaving in the story that food can tell to enhance and support the story you're telling about the city. The food story can enrich a tour and add an immersive element that today's tourists are seeking. And tourists are willing to pay more for a rich, immersive experience in the food elements that add value to the tour. So, what makes a successful food experience? So, here are a few factors to consider, and certainly this is not an exhaustive list. There'll be plenty more we can add to this. A suitable venue doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be fancy. It could reflect or it should reflect the style of the tour and the local architecture will be part of the overall story you're trying to tell. Quirky and unusual venues are often the most popular. What stories can, be, uh, can the food or cuisine tell about the history or culture of the location? Food can be the connecting factor in, in, in helping to understand the destination. For example, when Indian dentured laborers came to Ghana, they could not get the same herbs and spices that they could get back in India. They were forced to adapt and use what was available locally. And that's why Guyanese curry is quite different and unique compared to what you would enjoy in India. So visitors are on holidays and looking for enjoyment and fun. So think about the other elements you can weave together with the cuisine to create a fun overall experience. People are on their holidays and they want to enjoy themselves. And guides are such an important element to any tour and a food experience is no different. Having a guide with a, a strong and interesting personality 
will be a big factor in creating a successful food tour. Having culinary skills and experience is also key to a quality food tour. A food experience is already quite immersive, but it can be enhanced by adding opportunities for a participant, and not just as an observer, uh, but also to be a participant. It can be as simple as joining in shopping in the market through the hands-on experience in the food preparation. Often the meal itself will be challenging if it is vastly different from what a traveler is accustomed to eating at home. If you can be creative and insert unexpected surprises and experiences to the food tour, it makes it even more fun and adds value to the client. A few years back, we started to view food tourism as a way to enhance our trips and as a tool to sell them. Every travel trade show we attended, our long-term tour operators would ask us, what's new? But it's not always possible to have new tours every year, but we discovered that creating a new activity or experience could be enough to refocus them on an established tour. For example, by us changing a city tour to a market and city tour and adding lunch at the backyard cafe, it was enough for one of our uh, product managers to boost the marketing and reposition the 14 day tour and increase sales. So that one experience helped us get that, um, that 14 day tour back on sale. It was around that time that our product team were struggling to pull all the elements of a new food-based experience together. They were becoming quite frustrated with the process and lack of success. And they asked me, you know, how many lunches do we need to sell to make it financially worthwhile? Thinking that the, the sales of the, the lunches was what the key was. In fact, it's only one lunch. If it is the hook and the marketing focus, it leads to the sale of a larger trip. In a crowded marketplace, many trips can easily look similar or the same. A well-designed food experience can be the, the difference that sets your trip apart from the others in the marketplace. One of our most popular tours combines elements of the uh, capital city of Georgetown. The morning starts with a local street food breakfast, sampling some of our favorite dishes such as salt fish and bakes and pepper pot. Then with your guide Delve when you explore Ghana's largest market where he brings them, the market to life, experiencing the noise and color and smells of the market. And as you're traveling through the market, he's purchasing the things that you show an interest in. Then you head off to explore the, the, the city with your regular tour guide to see the architecture and visit museums. A few hours later, you come back and you re-meet Delvin at his house and his backyard, which is, known as the Backyard Cafe. And he will have prepared in those few hours the most amazing lunch uh, from the things that you've bought with him in the market. So this little garden oasis is a, um, you know, one of the best places in Guyana probably to, to eat and it's used for exclusive use. And you can also, if you wish, uh, change the, the experience slightly to uh, cook with Delvin as well. So creating venues. So the image on the left, uh, these are of the Backyard Cafe. You'll notice there, that he's used old wooden pallets, uh, which he has repurposed to make the perfect outdoor seating and create a, a fun, shabby chic atmosphere that is really loved by his visitors. In the center is simple folding up uh, camp tables and chairs with plastic plates and cups. At first glance, that looks like a pretty cheap location, but the fact that it's on the edge of a river at the foot of a mountain turns it into a magical place for lunch before climbing the mountain. The meal, of course, is the, the central uh, theme to any food experience. But the story around the food and the meal are really key to creating an interesting and satisfying food experience. So do some of your own research on the food in your area and see if there's a compelling backstory that needs to be told and can be used to create a narrative and meaningful and immersive experience for your clients. A really nice example of these elements is the Seven Curry Tour with the Singing Chef. Eon is a trained chef who has worked in the UK and Europe markets. Uh, when he returned to Ghana, he became passionate about the local cuisine and he's a pioneer in creating experiences around the local food. And, then, and in addition to that, he's also an accomplished musician. So he is the personality with the culinary skills, skills that we've just discussed. So the Seven Curry Tour tells a fascinating story about the influence of the Indian culture on Guyanese cuisine. Seven curry has evolved in Guyana and is now a staple at Indo-Guyanese weddings and celebrations. This tour starts in the morning by visiting a, a canal 
to pick up your uh, to, to cut and pick your own lotus leaf, which later becomes your dinner plate. You then travel into the city to visit Tony's puri shop, where you're taught to make your own puris, and of course you get to eat them as well. Next stop on the trip is to the local market, where Eon explains the many different fruits and vegetables that visitors are often not accustomed to at home. Eon purchases and guests try out fruit as you go through the market. And then you head off to a nearby spice factory to see the spices used in Guyanese curries, which as I previously mentioned, are often quite different from what you get in India. From there, it's then on to either Eon's home or a small local restaurant for a hands-on experience uh, preparing the seven curries under the tutelage of uh, Eon himself. And finally, you get to enjoy the seven curry meal out of the lotus uh, leaf that you picked earlier, while Eon plays guitar and sings Guyanese folk songs. So it's a wonderful combination of many elements, all telling a story involving the history of the country and the evolving cuisine of Guyana. So some food experiences can be quite complex, like the Seven Curry Tour, with many different elements. But equally, they can be simple but enjoyable experiences. One of my favourites on the return trip from a wildlife excursion, as we round the bend in the river, there on the sandbank are camp tables and chairs. Guests are delighted at the surprise and enjoy sunset drinks overlooking the river, followed by fresh fish caught from the river, barbecued over an open fire. There's very little cost involved, but it creates a lasting memory for visitors. Even sundowners can fall into this category. A beautiful location with a drink and local snack can be the perfect end to the day and combines with a chance to experience and uh, nature at the same time. One of my very personal favourites was uh, creating what we call the Tangalanga Bar. All we did was we painted a hand or hand painted sign on a piece of old board that you see there. We fixed it to the th three wheel motorbike that's used at the lodge for moving things around. Uh, we pack in some folding chairs and a nice box with drinks. Then unexpectedly, we just arrive when the guests are out on a nature or bird uh, watching walk late in the afternoon. All the guests' uh, experiences have been delighted with the surprise and enjoying the, the final uh, shafts of sunlight at the end of the day, having a drink and continuing with their bird watching and wildlife watching. Simplicity can sometimes be the, the greatest success. We all look for ways to successfully market our trips. The food angle is so on trend at the moment, and it's a great vehicle to interest media and create awareness in the destination and your tours. For an example, in February 2020, celebrity chef Gordon Ramsay visited uh, Guyana to film an episode for Uncharted uh, for the National Geographic Channel. He travelled with local chef Delvin Adams, who we introduced before from Backyard Cafe, and they went into the remote indigenous community of Rewa. On the back of this production, uh, Wilderness Explorers at Wilderness Explorers, we created a, a seven day tour called Uncharted Guyana in the footsteps of Gordon Ramsay. So this trip retraces his journey, the places he visited, and the tour is escorted by Delvin himself, who also was with uh, Gordon on the trip, and it combines adventure, nature, and food, and the culture of the indigenous people. I'm sure you're all aware of the many food related TV programs like MasterChef, Bake Off, and also the many that combine food and travel, such as Uncharted and Street Food. If you can create a food experience that then attracts media attention, it can be an amazing way to draw awareness to your destination and sell tours. Food tourism can also cross borders and help tie in different cultures and experiences to create multi destination tours. You already know, now know something of Guyana's cuisine, and uh, we take that and we combine it with the unexpected Javanese influence in Suriname, the South Eastern Asian food brought to the French Guyana by the Hmong people, helping us to create one of our fastest growing tours, uh, Discover the Hidden Guyanas, which crosses the three countries. So you then can combine elements. So combining various elements with, with food creates great experiences. Uh, a guest's favourite is stopping at the remote Pakarama Mountain Inn for lunch, 
and then pleasantly surprised as the owner Charlie brings out his guitar and sings during the meal. Really simple but effective and people thoroughly enjoy it. In Guyana, the indigenous culture holds a really important part in our tourism product. Their staple is cassava, a root vegetable that uh, they have nine different purposes for in their culture. They make cassava bread, they make their beer from it. They also even boil off the cyanide uh, to create casrit, which works as a meat preservative when making pepper pot. So you can take that and then tie it in with the other elements from their culture, such as fishing with bow and arrow, learning to weave a matter peak to prepare the cassava, and thus creating a, a really interesting storyline where the food is the centre, but tying in the other elements of, of their culture. Villages such as Warapoka grow their own coffee, and it's a rich experience to learn about how they process the coffee, and it also makes a perfect take-home souvenir. And tourism dollars are so important to these uh, remote communities. This experience can be even richer when it's combined with storytelling from village elders, uh, which visitors thoroughly enjoy. And it also reinforces the value of the indigenous culture for the community themselves. At uh, the village of Aranaputa, tourists can visit their small peanut butter factory that uses the peanuts grown by the villagers. The project started out originally to feed school children, uh, but it is now an important employer in the community and also has the added income from tourists visiting. And finally, I want to touch on um, the way to blend experiences. It is possible to blend and merge food related excursions that can be sold as separate standalone experiences, or you can blend them into a broader, more comprehensive narrative. Guyana's history of slavery, sugar and rum provides a fascinating insight into the country. And in this example here, we're combining three different trips. So the first one starts in the morning with a, a visit to Eiffelot Sugar Estate. This still functioning estate allows us to tell the story and give context to the slave trade and the legacy of this terrible time in Guyana's history. Visitors travel on the canals in sugar punts drawn by a team of oxen. They can then visit the fields where the cane cutters still hand cut the cane as they have done for centuries and chat to them about their work and their lives. Then you have the unique experience of lunch served in a sugar punt on the waterways overlooking the cane fields. It really is a quirky and incredibly interesting uh, experience on the, on the sugar estate. From there in the afternoon, you can travel to the Demerara Distillers Rum Factory. And this is where the world famous El Dorado rum is manufactured, uh, often voted the best rum in the world and certainly my favorite rum. So by visiting here, then learn about Guyana's rich history as a leading global rum exporter. And then you finally, you cap off the day back at the hotel with a rum tasting experience with a really experienced guide who explain the difference in the, in the various rums, the different ages and how they're distilled. And this can then be followed by a rum inspired dinner, ending a day blending Guyana's history, with food and drink and making you know, a really comprehensive experience which covers the history and the culture and the food and drink of Guyana. So I just want to thank you all for listening and hopefully uh, this has been interesting for you and give you some ideas and I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing perhaps what some of you are doing at some point and you're always welcome to come to Guyana and, uh, and learn about what monkey tastes like. Thanks James. Thank you for that Tony. Um, I'm not sure I'm going to take you up on that offer but we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, no, fantastic. Lots of really nice uh, examples in there. Um, great stuff. Okay, well, before we move on, let's just see what questions you guys have all been asking so far. Let's put our panel on the spot a little bit. Um, could I ask all of you guys to come back, please? I know you've all just disappeared. Tony, you still with us? Great. Okay, good. Got a couple of questions so far. I'm not going to spend too long on this one because we want to get on and hear how Esther's going to help us sell things because that's very important. Uh, but firstly, um, Tony, you mentioned uh, about uh, partnering up with Gordon Ramsay. Have you got any tips about how we could, how people could engage with celebrities or influencers? You know, how, what's the best way to start off going about that? 
sometimes it's by accident, uh, but in the last couple of years for us, we've done a lot in uh, sort of location production work with, with film crews. And once you can get into that, that marketplace um, and start to interact with them, and I guess using social media is a key way you can start following some of these influencers, for example, engaging with them, sending them ideas, um, and you just need to start talking to them. All of them are looking, you know, for what, what is the next hot thing out there? You know, Gordon Ramsay travels the world to film, as do many other of these people, and they need to keep presenting new ideas and new things. So if you've got something new, try and get it to them, and social media is, you know, a great vehicle for doing that. Yeah, good stuff. Excellent. Um, sorry, Tony, could I come back to you as well? You, uh, you, had, an, you had an example in there about cassava. Mm -hmm. So somebody asked about, um, you know, how, how can you make a food tourism experience if the product itself isn't the most exciting? So could you just give us a bit more detail about that cassava example, just because, you know, it's a staple, it's a staple ingredient. It's, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, so it seems unexciting by itself, but you can create experiences. For example, uh, we have one in one community where you go, you can go out to the farm with the family. So their farms traditionally are outside the village, walk out. You can be involved in working on the farm with them. You can pick cassava. You can then come back and be involved in the processing uh, of the cassava, cooking with the family. Um, the, the men in the family traditionally weave. So whilst your food's cooking, you can be learning to weave. So you can create stories around it. So that is very central to their, their culture. And whilst it's not the most exciting thing, the whole story around their culture and how that binds it together can be really fascinating. And you know, for, of course, it's not going to be for everyone, but for the right people, getting out there, getting your hands dirty, you know, digging up cassava, bring it back, and processing it can be you know, a really enriching experience. Okay, good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you for that. Uh, right. Okay, I've had a question from uh, oh Tariq and Jordan. How do you deal with different restrictions tourists might have due to religious beliefs, health diets, allergies, things like that? I mean, how how deep should we go in terms of food tourism? How deep should we go into catering for absolutely all of the needs that customers might have? Given that could be quite difficult, depending on where we are and the kind of cuisine we're talking about and things like that. Do you want me to handle that one too, James? Or? If you feel like it, Tony, or I could yeah. invite somebody okay. else. Yeah. Well, just very quickly, as a destination management company, of course, we're dealing with people coming from around the world. Um, part of our communication with them before a trip is understanding their dietary requirements. So all the people we work with in country are quite accustomed to people coming with very specialized diets. And thus far, we've always been able to handle whatever those requirements are. We haven't had one that we haven't been able to cater to. I think it's really important when people come in their holidays, they still need to feel comfortable. And if they have religious or you know medical reasons or uh, about particular foods they need to eat, we'll always try to do our best to cater for them. Yeah. Esther, have you got anything you'd like to add to that? No, I think I joined Tony in this one. Of course, I mean, as a small TA for food experiences, we are dealing with a lot of uh, different food requirements. But that's why, I mean, we are really, you know, listening to uh, all the needs. Uh, for example, I'm celiac, so I always have to communicate to everybody that I cannot eat everything. So it's always, you know, good to communicate directly with your food guide so you don't have any any kind of problem about it. I always find an arrangement with people, so I think it's, uh, it's something that, I mean, we just need to communicate exactly what we are looking for. Yeah. Definitely, good stuff. Uh, sorry, Tony, can I come back to you again? Sorry, I'm not making you monopolise this, but um, somebody's asked that Tanga Langa bar, which looks very cool, <laughs> by the way. Do you do you charge your guests extra for that, given it's a kind of a, an ad hoc surprise? Is it an extra cost to them for doing that, or is it just something you build into the cost of the, of the package? No, it, I mean, it, it has incredibly low cost for us. We have the motorbike on site, we move it about a mile down to where they're bird watching. Uh, we have the, the you know the fold up chairs and things. Where we do make money is when they're drinking, and it goes onto their bar bill. So we get them drinking when they're out, we normally out bird watching, so we make a little income that way. But it's actually more about 
I love to create surprises on trips. I don't like to tell people about everything they're going to experience. I want to surprise them. And this is one of those surprises that, you know, even the, the staff who are involved in it, they get great enjoyment in arriving on that motorbike and seeing the expression on people's faces when they, you know, they've yeah. arrived and they realize it's a bar and, and what it all means. So it's not always about making money. You're creating experiences and those people become the ambassadors who sell your trips for you and you're making money long term by doing that. Yeah, good stuff. I mean, uh, you know, as you said, that's what contributes to the experience. And that perhaps is the one that makes it memorable. You know, it's just that element of surprise that we did not expect that, that was going to happen and enjoying the fantastic drinks you get out of it. It's yeah, it's good stuff. Uh, OK, yeah. just a couple more. Um, how, how can we stand out if there's already a lot of food tourism activity in our destination? Esther, do you have any thoughts on that? Say, for example, if you were trying, you know, if you're trying to do something in a destination that already promotes an awful lot of food tourism experience and stuff, how, what are the kind of things that you could do to stand out? Yeah, I mean, that's a really good question. Of course, I mean, the idea, it's a lot about how you tell a story. For example, I see Tony proposed like this uh, amazing experience about like the singing chef. So I think there is a lot of storytelling to build around this one. Because basically people, especially when they buy something online, uh, let me say that they buy a story before because they don't know anything about uh, the experience. They are just, you know, do a leap of trust. So I think that's really important to really create a story about around your product. And as you, Tony said before, I mean, also the presence of social media and also try to have like a really good connection with your customers. So I um, build a lot of reviews because I mean, your customer are the best promoters. If they love the experiences, they are the one they're gonna tell about the experience and they're gonna, you know, tell around them so they can really post about it also. Yeah, I think it's really good, you know, to tell a story for everything. And of course, like having a good and excellent product because of course, I mean, there is a lot of competition. So, I mean, it's really good to do something that is kind of unique. So fill the gap that it's uh, not in the market but also tell a good story around your product. Yeah, yeah, and I think that, yes, definitely. I mean, it kind of echo, I mean, I'm putting words in Tony's mouth here, but it's kind of echoed everything he said and certainly some of the points Alison made as well. You know, it's all about the story, the quality, you know, giving people that really memorable experience as part of it and, you know, asking them to help you get that word out as well. Um, and I'd also like to recommend, uh, somebody posted in the comments, uh, Rajiv, who runs India Food Tour, has said, uh, they have their chefs, their chefs are their food guides. So the people who are actually doing the cooking are the people who are out there interacting with the customers. So they're getting that amazing experience directly from the people who know exactly what they're doing. So, you know, it's it's great. Okay, uh, we will take some more questions later on. I'd just like to mention a couple of things. Uh, Lewis from Vietnam, yes, I have tried your local food. Vietnamese food is unbelievably amazing. Um, it's honestly some of the best food I've tried in the world. I, I don't say that lightly. I had some amazing food experiences in Vietnam. Um, and somebody else has asked about Sri Lankan food. You know, what's the demand for Sri Lankan foods from the European market? I personally don't know the answer to that one. I don't know if anyone has. Esther, do you include Sri Lankan? Is Sri Lanka a part of your Eat With network? Mm, we have some experiences, but well, I think it's really a market that needs to be discovered, especially by, Europe by Europeans. Mm -hmm. Because as you said before, James, Vietnamese food is really well known in Europe. As Sri Lankan, I think, I mean, there is something that can be done also by, you know, uh, also the tourist board maybe in Sri Lanka in order to promote more this kind of food among like uh, Europeans, Americans, because it's true mm. that we have a lot to discover about it. Yeah, and I think that actually links Second into, I... sorry, Alison, please. Yeah, just going to add to that, really, you can see the popularity of Indian food generally um, in Europe. I mean, it's incredibly popular. And I think when you start to get into the speciality dishes of different regions you know, in Sri Lanka and, you know, what Sri Lanka has got to offer that's different from the sort of general food that you find over here, people are really interested. And I think like any country, you know, that's got a great cuisine, people want to experience it. So, you know, the more that you can uh, showcase that it's specifically from Sri Lanka that why you've got a different dish from that particular place in Sri Lanka you know the more people are going to be interested um, and I think it reflects what we talked about earlier in terms of how do you create a great experience when there's a very crowded market and lots of food experiences already you know you really want to understand what's 
you know what you know what you're confident about what's special about what you do so that you're creating a very general you know very genuine story and, and product um, and not you know just trying to create something that maybe you don't know about so much and you know trying to um, just add to market I think you always want to go back to what you know well and what is really genuine to you and your story and you know, what you can offer yeah, and I, I could totally agree with that. And I think there's a follow-up question that, that that same person's asked. Um, you know, that is the point. It's while your customers are going to be in, interested in certain things and they're going to like to eat certain things, it's your job to convey your culture, your story, your tastes, your products, the things that you have in your place. You should be trying to get those over. Many of the examples Tony gave is exactly that. You know, not many people perhaps would have chose would, would choose to cook that stuff at home, but this is where it's it's different it's new exciting it's something they can do in the place and get it from the experts and you know i hope everyone agrees with me that's what really makes a great food tourism yeah, experience it's, uh, really create an adventure i will say because i mean yeah. as Alison was saying like indian food okay everybody knows about it but really going in deep like in the region in sri lanka it's really create something that is really authentic and create an adventure for uh, the traveler because they are going there and they can also experience something really that it's more because it's culture it's food and also it's like meeting local people that is really important yeah good stuff okay we will be doing some more questions later on please keep asking them as you can see we do actively read the questions things we are answering individual questions from people so please do keep asking um okay thank you everybody i would just like to turn our attention now to how we can put our food experiences in front of our customers so this is all about the important routes to market um just before i hand over to esther I just like to put up another poll. We just like to know from you guys how you feel about which sales channels you currently focus on. So, very simply, what's the main route you use or would use to promote your tour, your food experiences? Do you promote them directly through your own websites, through your own social media activity? Do you use a specialist food tour operator? Do you use a general tour operator? Do you work? exclusively with an OTA or is it another way? I'm just going to put that poll up now. That poll is now open. You should be able to vote. We're just interested in how you're getting your product out in front of your customers. Uh, okay, got some good numbers coming in there. Okay, it's quite interesting. Uh, I'm just going to give that a couple more minutes. So are you selling it directly to them? Are you going through a tour operator? And if so, is it a specialist food tour operator or just a general one? Or are you working with an online tour operator? Or you don't know. Okay, I'm going to close that now. Okay, now that's really interesting. So nearly half of you are basically selling directly. That's an interesting statistic. Um, I'm really intrigued that only 6% of you would think of an online travel agent as your, uh, your primary route to market. Really interesting. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And that segues very nicely into asking Esther to talk about how we can reach our market. So, Esther, as the head of marketing at a dedicated food OTA, this is definitely your area of expertise. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, that's the wrong one. Uh, I'm going to ask you the big question, okay? What are the best ways to get our product in front of our customers? Yes, thank you, James. So let me, <laughs> that's a very complex question, let's say. So I just- uh, I apologize, but you know. <laughs> but let me, you know, talk a little bit more about Eat With and then we can go in some practical tips for our audience. Uh, it's really interesting, actually, the polls, because I mean, uh, uh, I'm talking as an OTA. So I think it's, uh, I'm really impressed by the fact that it's only, you know, it was 6%. So let's try to deep dive into it. And uh, I hope that I will give you some practical advice that I can help you also working with OTAs in general. Um, so that's just you know, the real introduction. Uh, just me, thank you for joining. Uh, let me uh, talk a little bit more about EatWits. Um, I mean, that's why it's the magic of EatWits. Because I mean, as I said before, 
uh, we really believe that uh, I mean it's really important to create unique food experiences. It's really an adventure for people because right now, as you know, we have the possibility of before the pandemic, we had the possibility to travel all over the world, but it's really difficult to find and meet local people. So that's why I mean for us it was really important. It's really our mission to make like people have a really authentic and immersive experiences. And the best way to get people immersed in a culture. Uh, for us, I mean, we strongly believe that it's, it's really through the food because it's a cultural experience. It's something that it's unique from all the region, for a single region. So that's why, I mean, we believe that really it's uh, the good way, the good way to convey like a uh, good experience and uh, lasting memory to tourists that they are traveling to to a new to city or a new region. So eat within numbers. Um, eat with, as I said before, is the largest community for authentic culinary experiences with locals. Um, we founded the company in 2014 and actually we were able to have more than uh, 25,000 host, uh, local hosts selected by our team uh, joining our platform. We are present in uh, more than 100 countries. Uh, most of our experiences are uh, in Europe, US, Asia, especially right now we are working really actively in China, uh, but also we have like uh, experience in Africa and, and all the other continents. Um, we are proposing and selecting actually um, dining experiences that are our co core business, so mainly supper club or really dinners with local, food tours, cooking classes, and also, I mean, during the pandemic, we launched some online experiences. We are collaborating with brands like uh, Master Chef, and we have also, of course, like really professional chef, but also uh, people that there are, you know, just sharing their culture or what we call like local guide and local host. Mm. So that's really the point that helped me, you know, reply to this big question about how to to sell experiences. Because as we said before, I mean, we can have like the best product, we can think about the best service that we can have, but I mean, we really need to understand our public uh, in order to not waste time and to not miss the opportunity to stand out the the crowd and also um, have like you know good sales and everything. So. Uh, let's start from the basics. So I'm joining what Alison was saying at the beginning. So uh, this is slide with a lot of like trends that there are right now in the industry. Um, and that's, I mean, it's something that I mean, it's really good to be aware of because I mean, it's really help us to build experiences that are interesting for our audience. Um, so I think that here, uh, the most important thing is really to understand, for example, the demographic. Uh, we mentioned before, like the millennials are the one that are more interested in this kind of like food experiences and food tourism. Um, they really sometimes choose a destination just for having food adventures. Uh, so that's why I mean, and they really want something that is really authentic, unique. So that's why I mean, as Alison was saying before, it's really important to not uh, make up something, but really propose and showcase your culture and the best thing for, for yourself. So uh, that's. I mean, the first step for me is really identify your customer persona. Uh, it's really something that, I mean, it's a basic market technique, but it's really interesting to create like your ideal customers. So uh, from the demographic and the data that I showed you before, you can really understand what is the best person that you can sell your product to. Uh, it's really important to understand your audience, also to um, really craft, craft and create your product. So as we said, I mean, uh, before, like for the allergies, uh, all the diet requirements that we have right now, uh, it's really good to, you know, take them all um, in account when you're creating your experiences and also uh, when you develop like a specific product, for example, understand your audience that maybe you need like, I don't know, a pickup at their or hotel or they need, for example, right now with the COVID, a flexible cancellation policies. And also the most important thing to understand how to uh, reach their attention and what is the best channels and the marketing campaign that you can put in place in order to uh, target this audience. So here we have, for example, an example. I totally create this person uh, from, you know, uh, some Google Analytics data, internal and also external data. So uh, this is one of our ideal customers. It's a kind of a globetrotter is uh, a woman because I mean, there are in general the decision maker in travel. And it's really interesting to see where she's um, getting the information, how she plan um, her trip. Because I mean, uh, right now I see from the market two tendons. 
people are uh, booking uh, really in advance, like, I don't know, two months in advance or really in destination. Most of the bookings are when people are already in destination, but there are really a good amount of people, up to 40%, that are planning even three months before the experience. So it's really good to capture their attention and also um, to be present and visible online. So uh, let's present you Sarah, so you will have <laughs> more information about her life. Uh, and just a quick recap about like the main distribution channels. So as we said before, like we have some direct sales, and I know that you use it a lot, like from the pool that James will over, and, and direct. So we have also the a lot of OTAs, local partners, tour operators, but also there is this new actually um, tendency, of course, that the, the online search. Uh, because that can influence also the other channel because maybe people are buying on your website but most of the time they are also doing some research around so they are visiting for example TripAdvisor to see if you have reviews or Yelp or even like as they are really uh, people are right now really influenced by social media they are looking for things to do from their favorite influencers or bloggers uh, or even like other publication that can be good, you know, to reach uh, your customers and ideal customers. So here I, you know, play around and create like an ideal distribution channel for uh, millennials. So to target our VR Sarah that we met before. So of course, I mean, um, the millennial customer will be a lot online. Um, so that's why, I mean, it's really good to be present on your own social media channels and also to partner up or just, you know, as we said before about Gordon Ramsay, uh, contact people that you want to work with. Uh, because, I mean, even if sometimes it's uh, expensive, even like, uh, but I mean, it's good to find people that there are, uh, they have an audience that is good and they're really similar to your product. It's kind of uh, uh, sharing value and create something together, like really a partnership. So sometimes, I mean, I work with influencers that they were more interested in promoting experience that they believe in than, you know, just have uh, uh, some money to do a post of a story. Also, I really suggest you to have, to have like uh, your own dedicated newsletters. So let people know about you, what you are offering. Uh, and also, of course, like be updates you all like the news or new product that you are, you are proposing. Uh, a lot of people, I think that many of you that are doing Facebook and Google ads and also other kind of ads, but that's, I mean, there are the two main platforms for that. Uh, social media posts, that it's organic, of course, it's really good to create like an engaged audience. Uh, so please like ask your customers to follow you, to post about you and your products, create maybe, you know, dedicated hashtag or use the hashtag that are really linked to your products. I'm also using a lot affiliation networks, um, affiliation like AWIN and CJ, they are the most well-known in the world. Um, and it's really, let's say, low-ending fruits, or there's kind of thing that you can do easily, because I mean, it's really, um, this kind of platform allow you to communicate with a lot of uh, publisher that can publish about uh, your content in exchange of a commission. Um, online forums and the review collector like Yelp and TripAdvisor are really keys because people are just checking uh, and want you know to have some reason to believe that uh, your uh, your product is good. Uh, as I said before, when you are booking something online, you are kind of like do a leap, leap of trust because I mean you don't know yet the experience and maybe you are spending a, a good amount of money. So reviews are really important and also be present on some Facebook group, for example, of travelers giving tips and this kind of thing. Uh, offline, I think it's work a lot also when you are already in destination, because of course you are using OTAs and stuff, but I mean, when you are, for example, already arriving destination, it's good to walk in. So uh, just, I mean, if you have, the, for example, uh, collect information before, um, just go there and uh, uh, book your experience. Also, hostels and hotels are really important. Local partners and concierge are really good as well. Uh, among the um, indirect sales channel, uh, of course, like uh, tour operators, uh, as you said, also in the pool are really important. Travel agents, uh, for us, I mean, for example, we are working a lot with independent travel agents that they are promoting our experiences and they are create their own package. So basically they have you know, just squeeze our experience in some uh, of the packages they have for their clients. It's really customized, uh, but it's really good to uh, 
satisfy a lot of ex a lot of needs of our customers and OTAs for us are really important as well. Uh, sorry. Uh, I had the problem with my slides, so I let me pull over again. Sorry, guys. So here I'm just going in some example of distribution channel mix. Um, so um, let's move on. So here I just, uh, you will see some, some ideas, some trends that I see after the pandemic. So uh, when markets are reopening, so basically in uh, around May, um, I see a type of booking that are different. As you see, it's C2C open, it's mean um, basically free independent travelers uh, that they are not, you know, traveling in travel in groups anymore, but they are just going there and book directly on, uh, on our website or via the OTAs, but they are not traveling with big tour operators. Uh, C2C private, I see that because of COVID, I mean, uh, now we have the 17% of tours that are booked, booked at private, uh, because I mean, people with the COVID, they prefer not to mingle a lot with people. So we are also trying to fulfill their requests. So again, come back to the customer persona, so understand if people want to have something that is more private or want to, mean to have a full experience is meeting new people, but it's uh, really social right now, so I know that it's difficult. And we see that the B2B uh, private and open bookings are less because I mean, before it was really about like big groups and working with big tour operators. About the distribution mix, here I put some ideal stuff, let's say. So um, for me, really strategic. I see that, I mean, of course, like paid social has uh, a really good impact. Uh, but also, I mean, I love to privilege uh, experience when I have like more, let's say, control on the revenue and how much I spend to, pro to promote uh, my tours. So that's why, I mean, for me, it's really interesting uh, working with OTAs in general, uh, because of course they are asking for a, a big commission, uh, but I, it's always, always a flat commission, so I really have visibility on that. Uh, as I said before, for me, it's really interesting also travel agent affiliation and the tour operators in general, among with, of course, social media, because it's a channel that we've seen grow a lot in the last months. Best practice. So I hope that in this way, giving you some really um, practical advice. So it's really good to create like a sustainable mix to increase sales. So uh, we have the tendency when we launch a new product, for example, to work a lot with pay advertising but it's difficult to control the return of investment. So it's really good to have like a big mix and different uh, business model in order to partner in different way with different partners. Um, that's why, I mean, as I said, I will privilege and invest more in uh, channels where I can really uh, control the acquisition cost of the different clients. Uh, so at Eatwit, for example, we are working a lot with revenue share model. Uh, so we are taking like a lot of OTAs a commission and in general I try to uh, privilege this uh, partnership when I can really share our revenue in order to not have like any cost up front. I'm always trying to uh, try new channels so for example affiliation or like uh, really partner with new OTAs or even offline like uh, some kind of uh, I don't know working with festivals or other way to get like more um, uh, more attention to my products and also uh, especially in the last years we are tra we are working a lot with influencers and bloggers um, for us of course it's really important as well as we said like in direct sales are really important create our own uh, reputation and also visibility on um, on the web so creating our own website and also uh, really create our social media network and also invest a lot in the relation with our customers. I mean, um, when we have created the, the company in 2014, for example, we hired a lot of people working at our customer service because we really want to have a customer service that is really key as our sales uh, channels, because I mean, they are the one that can really uh, provide a great, pro a great experience to our users and also our kind of a sales channel as well because they give recommendation and also um, really take by hand our customer all along, over the process. Um, really treat well your customers, it's key, uh, providing them a quality product because I mean they can be the one that uh, can leave great uh, reviews and also um, by word of mouth really um, promoting your events. 
So it's really key to invest and having give them a memorable experiences uh, so they talk about you and, uh, and your product. Here, there are some of our partners. So there are the main partners that they are working with. You will see it's uh, uh, some of them, there are more foodies, more local, or really some of them are really big. And uh, I think that most of you are working already with them, like uh, TripAdvisor, Booking, Viator. Uh, but well, I just wanted to give you an overview of uh, a mix of, of uh, partners that you can build. Um, I just want to give you an example about the work that we are doing with Marriott Bonvoy. Mm, you will also have links so you can go around. Uh, it's a good example of uh, uh, working with the OTAs that it's also a loyalty program. So on these OTAs, for example, you can uh, buy um, experiences using your, your points. Uh, a car in Europe is doing the same. So basically, I mean, it's really good to squeeze in this kind of uh, experiences because I mean, as they are paying by points, it's good also to uh, give them great uh, discounts or other things for all the customers that are really price sensitive. Another thing, um, it's having a good exposure. So um, my uh, goal here was to have like uh, a dedicated shelf uh, on such of, uh, of these uh, OTAs in order to have more visibility because I mean as you know the problem with OTAs and uh, I think that's the reason why only for only for just the six percent was one of the best channel uh, is that it's really difficult to stand, uh, stand out so that's why I mean sometimes it's good to negotiate with them where to place your product so for example being in uh, dedicated filters for food or if you are doing something that i don't know it's only a private tour uh, just you know it's really good to uh, communicate uh, with your account manager in these otas in order to find a way to promote in the most efficient way your product um, again uh, another example of partnership with TripAdvisor. for example we are working in the restaurant part um, and we really want to, uh, we negotiated as well uh, the dedicated shelf. I know because I mean we are maybe a little bit bigger than an independent tour operator, but um, it's good and because I mean it does give you a lot of visibility and also uh, uh, that we said, as we said before, a sense of trust around your product. I just want to uh, finish with some online trends for 2021. It's true that now we are <laughs> at the end of the year, but it's good to, to have a sum up of what were the trends this year. So uh, virtual experiences is something that, of course, I mean, most of you worked with that, I suppose, during the pandemic. Uh, but I will um, not, you know, totally kill this kind of product. Uh, but because I mean, it's a good way also to showcase your product online, for example. So uh, organizing, I don't know, um, free demonstration on your um, Instagram account, for example. Because I mean, it's really good to have to give the people already a glimpse of what experience they can uh, they can live, so they can uh, trust you more and uh, book your experiences. Of course, everything was around TikTok. That's the new one. So new social media. Uh, TikTok is really good because, I mean, uh, it's only about videos. It's for a demographic that it's uh, millennials, but Generation uh, Z especially. So it's um, maybe it's a little bit younger, but it's good also to be present there to showcase your product. OTAs for me, it's one of the advice because, I mean, people are the tendency to use OTAs, especially to book hotel. So, for example, booking represents right now in Europe the 64% of the market and they are also promoting experiences. So it's good to be where the people are looking for product and experiences. Uh, last but not least is working on your own channels. So uh, the local SEO, uh, I think it's something that is really uh, important to invest into uh, because I mean, it's an organic channels, but I mean, it's, uh, it's really good to uh, be there because I mean, most of the people, of course, they are searching for uh, experiences on Google. So be better ranking on that. Uh, it's one of the best way to be visible and uh, found by people. So I hope that you have some questions, but I mean, you will find at the end of the presentation also my mail. So if you need anything, please uh, drop me an email. We'll be happy to, to reply to your question, even if you have right now, but maybe later. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Esther. Uh, that's fantastic. Okay. Brilliant. Um, I'm... Wow, there was a lot in there. Uh, I'd just like to remind everyone that we are going to be providing you with all of the slides that 
Esther and Tony and Alison have shared, plus a recording of this. So you can dig into all of that lovely detail that Esther shared as well. So yeah, thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, I wonder if it's inspired any further questions from our audience. Uh, Tony, Alison, would you mind uh, rejoining us just so that we can <laughs> delve into a few of those? I'll be honest, I think most of them might be for Esther, but you know. <laughs> Don't let me alone in the panel. No, don't leave. It's fine. Okay, so couple right. So we've had quite a lot, uh, quite a lot come in. So um wow, where to start with this? Uh Esther, how does Eat With recruit experiences? How do you go out and what's your criteria for choosing who you work with? So I mean, this is really the core of our business because I mean we love to work with the community. I use the word community on purpose because I mean we really want to also among our host or chef create a sense of community because I mean it's really one of our value. Uh, for the recruitment, actually, uh, we have a lot of spontaneous um, can application, so people can really apply. And then uh, we have a dedicated team, our community team, that's really go over every single application in order to see if there is a fit or not. So first of all, of course, it's the quality of the experiences, but also it's try to find something that is unique for our audience. So really authentic, immersive, and giving something that is something more to our customers. Okay, and how do you guys ensure the quality of those experiences? So, I mean, when we can, of course, we have people in the different places that they are going. We call that city ambassadors. So they are also meet people in person. We are doing a lot of, uh, before COVID, we were doing a lot of meet up among our hosts in order to know them. Uh, but also, I mean, we are doing that online, like uh, most of our sharing economy uh, website, like Airbnb, we have really a process when you have to reply to a lot of questions, giving like us information. Uh, but also, I mean, we have people that are experts in, uh, they're expert foodies, I will say. So they are kind of like trying to get more information about your experiences and also get in touch with someone, with the applicants to discover more about the experience. So it's really a process, we call it onboarding process. That can, it can take a lot of time, but we really okay. want to get to know people as much as we can. That's fine. I, I mean, I should say I've had a lot of questions in here about people basically asking, you know, what's Eat With doing? How can we get involved? Are you planning to expand into India? That's one of them. Are you interested in stuff in Kampala? Um, I would suggest, well, let's not delve too much into those, but uh, Esther's details are provided in the slides. So if anyone would like to contact her and discuss further, please do. Um, try and keep this a little bit more general rather than just uh, recruiting people for Eat With, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so actually another question actually for you. You mentioned uh, affiliation networks. Could you yes. just expand a little bit what you meant by that and how people could get involved with them? Yes, affiliation networks are really platform when you where you can um, basically communicate with a lot of publisher. For example, if I am a food blogger, I can be uh, part of these networks. I mean, for example, I can join uh, AWIN, that is one of the bigger ones, and they have like a dedicated uh, vertical to food. So for example, right. I am a travel blogger, I join mm. AWIN, and I can have um, a lot of uh, content that they can publish for, for example, uh, tour operators. So as at Eatwitz, uh, we are posting a lot of information about us, so people can do uh, basically easily going there, and see what it is uh, proposing and create a blog article about it. Uh, AWIN is really good because they already uh, provide tracked links. So anytime we have a sales coming from a food blogger, for example, uh, mm -hmm. we can uh, track it and uh, correspond them a commission. With AWIN, all this process about like calculating commission and also having tracked link, it's really, uh, uh, really managed by uh, the platform. So it's really okay. easy to work with. Uh, basically, uh, in, uh, a publisher like uh, like us just have to uh, create our accounts and give them of course like the level of commission and also provide them with all the details and information about your tours and for mm -hmm. example if you have a special Christmas promotion uh, send a newsletter to uh, via the network to let people know so it's really interesting to work with because I mean you don't have to contact one by one old bloggers uh, yeah, and sure. also give you access to maybe smaller blog that you are not considering right now, uh, but they can bring to you traffic and, and conversions. Mm, good stuff. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, okay, somebody else has asked, uh, I don't know, this one actually might be more for Tony, but you never know. 
what is the best way to get the attention of travel agents? We've written many emails to share our new unique food experience and got zero interest from them. Any tips to grab people's attention? Um, well, maybe not so much travel agents. We tend to deal with more with tour operators, but yeah, their inbox is full of plenty of people pitching to them. The, the secret is to have something in the subject line that's going to make them open up your email. Yeah, that's the first thing because too many just get deleted at that first glance at, at the uh, at the subject line. So that'll be the key. And then have something really interesting and make sure it's in the first line or two. Get your pitch over in one or two lines. They're not going to read a long email. They're too busy. If you can't sell it in one or two sentences, you're probably not going to get any further than that. It's a fair point. Esther, do you have any, Esther Allison, you anything you'd like to add to that? I think that Tony made totally a point. So, of course, I mean, uh, these people have like plenty of emails and stuff. So, again, like, um, maybe contact them also by LinkedIn sometimes. So change the channel because I mean, that's really a, a really quick tip, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, but it can be good. Uh, and also maybe join some groups of uh, travel agents, like for example, Virtuoso or Ensemble, um, and post in their dedicated groups and make you, you know, send out in another way. Uh, because of course, I mean, emails, we are sending them a lot of emails, for example, and it's true that we don't have always a reply, but maybe, you know, just, uh, uh, contact them via multi-channel strategy. It can be also another another way to get their attention. Sure, sure. So yeah, yeah if email's not working out for you, try try something different. You know, there's always different ways to get hold of people. I think Sorry, one I'm thing sorry. that you know, spe well, with with specialist tour operators that are looking for that, you know, food experience. I think most of them are looking for suppliers that they have some recommendation for. You know, I think the tour operators really need to be sure that they can deliver a really high quality. Um, experience for their clients so they're going to be asking around they're going to be wanting to hear about somebody that's good they want to talk to people they've met and you know that's about building up network you know personal networks I mean either at trade shows or you know at the moment you know it's been good during lockdown with more virtual trade shows so if you can't get there in person um, you know look at opportunities for trade fairs that are online start to build relationships as Esther was saying earlier you know connect to people through social media engage with them on a b2b basis as well as just as sort of direct to consumer so I think you're trying to find ways of really building up some personal relationships so that you know you can find out who wants the type of experience you have to offer and then sure. when you find that person they know who you are there's a sense of trust there Okay. Yeah, definitely. All good stuff. Good stuff for good tips to get started. Um, Esther, can I ask you a very specific question? So somebody has said uh, TripAdvisor limits us by their food categories. So a meal with a local host is not a restaurant, nor is it a tour. Any tips on how to work within these constraints on TripAdvisor? Um, I'm working directly with Viator and they're really advocating to have this uh, new filter about food experiences. So I think that it's something that, I mean, it's really a request, but it's true that you can find some niche, I would say. So if, for example, if your tour is more like a cooking class, of course, I mean, try to get there. That is kind of, uh, they have also subcategories. So they have food, but also try to find the subcategory that really describe better your product. Um, so for example, I've just noticed that, I mean, um in for in general working with the otas it's good to have like uh, a lot of availabilities that it's something i mean because they have an algorithm so it's really good to be in ranked by availabilities commission but also i mean be in the specific categories so they can promote you in the best way uh, i know that sometimes i mean the the category are really strict and most of the product and experience that we are creating like the one that tony was showing before are kind of fluid so just try to get the best uh, category and uh, they have like for example Viator they have uh, really good uh, account managers so just keep, keep get in touch with them and I'm sure that they will help you out to find the best way to describe your product. Good stuff okay and just quickly sorry that uh, the affiliate network you were talking about was called AWIN yes. A -W -I -N, yeah? yes you will find okay. it also in the deck uh, but I mean, they are one of the biggest ones, so I'm not, you okay. know, advertise any of them. I mean, AWIN and CJ are the biggest one in the world, uh, but okay. you have also other that there are more dedicated maybe to food or travel, 
uh, there are really lists, but these two are really the biggest ones. So I really suggest you to try okay. to uh, deal with them. Okay, thank you. Well, I hope that's made um, Silvana very happy because she was asking about that one. Okay, good stuff. Uh, I am going to let's. We're running rapidly out of time here. Uh, we do have a couple more questions, but um, I think it might make sense to sum up a little bit first. And if we've got any time left at the end, we will do a few more. So um, we've covered a lot of ground today. Uh, we'd like to make sure it's as useful as possible. So let's sum up. Um, Alison. Could I come back to you? Could you just give us a couple of the key points or takeaways you'd like people to, to take from this session? Yes, thanks very much. So we've covered a lot. I just want to um, sort of just sum them up here in a few points that um, we've we've covered really. Just thinking about some of the, you know, how to create a good food experience, which Tony uh, went through um, with lots of great examples. So. First of all, you know, a great food experience can differentiate and sell a tour. And I think that was a really interesting point. You don't have to create a new tour. You can just add a new experience if you get it right. Um, you need to understand the influence of your culture and your history and what that's had, you know, what influence that's had on your local food. So really understand that um, story behind what's local to you and then use that to add value create a really good hands-on experience that you can tell that story um, at the same time as people really getting stuck into that experience um, find guides that have got great personalities and um, also ideally that have culinary skills if they're going to be part of the experience you want to find a suitable venue as tony said you know if it's quirky and unusual that really adds to the atmosphere but don't forget about hygiene, health and safety. It's critical, really important for, for the European American markets or for anybody that, um, you know, people will look for that. Um, and very importantly, keep it, keep it simple and make it fun. That's what people want. They want an enjoyable experience that they can, can share. Um, so in terms of selling, um, as Esther said, you know, you really have got to be customer centric. Uh, you need to identify who your clients are going to be. Are you going to be selling to individuals, the FIT market, the uh, independent market, millennials, or are you going to look at groups, small groups or business travel? So you want to be able to target very, um, very specifically. And then you really need to understand that consumer that you're targeting. You've got to know what their desires are, what their expectations. So use data, use analytics to create your customer personas and understand what their barriers are to buying, what their concerns are, and then you can create solutions that will address those. So you really do have to need to get under the skin of your potential client. Um, when it comes to your distribution networks, you can't do everything. You've really got to decide what works best for you, um, but you do want to mix you know, between online, direct and indirect. And I think ESSA really made that very valuable point about whoever you're working with, you want to think about partnerships. You can't do it all yourself. You know, it's good to share. It's good to, to build up partnerships where you can do some mutual uh, promotion. Online, make sure you engage, make sure you um, get involved with the conversations online and collect reviews. You know, your customers are very much your best promoters. So, you know, once you've got your experience, up and running, uh, collect those positive reviews and make sure you share them. And I think, you know, the rest of the detail will be in the, the deck that will be sent round. So I hope that just summarizes pretty much what we've been talking about today. Fantastic, thank you, Alison. That's uh, that's brilliant. Um, Esther, Tony, if you're still there, is there anything else you guys would like to add? Any kind of big points that you just like everyone to, to kind of go away with from today? Tony first, perhaps? Yeah, I, I think if you can create something that you enjoy, there's a fair chance customers will as well. And, you know, look at what's available in your city or your area that perhaps is not being utilised and that you can turn into, you know, a really meaningful experience that customers will enjoy. And it tells a story about you, about your destination and customers. As far as I can see, they're really hungry to learn about and understand the destination. It, it makes their trip so much more satisfying. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, Esther, anything you'd like to add? 
No, but well, I just want to thank you, Alison, because I think that the, was really good tips to keep the experience simple and fun, because basically people are traveling, they want to discover, they really want an adventure. So it's really important. I mean, everything is starting from the quality of the experiences and also uh, creates a really memorable time for your customers. Then you can have, of course, like all the kind of uh, sales technique that you want. But I mean, the first thing is really find something that your customer will love and they will remember and they will talk about it. Yep, definitely, good stuff. Okay, uh, sorry, I'm sadly, we are running very short of time uh, and I'm afraid we don't have time for any more questions. I do apologize to everyone we haven't answered. Um, we've had a couple come in just now about Tanzania. I do apologize for that, um, but hopefully we've got as many as we could have done. Um, therefore, that's all the content we have for today. Um, that just leaves me to invite Jeanette from CBI. Jeanette, are you there? Hi, James. I'm here. Right. Jeanette would like to just, well, I say Jeanette. Jeanette is going to be talking, and then I'm going to be trying to show you what she's talking about on the CBI website, so you can find access to all of the <laughs> great, all this great information, reports, and things like that. So over to you, Jeanette, sort of. Yes. Thanks, James. So at www.cbi.eu slash tourism, um, you will find the market information available, including the newly published food tourism report, which has been presented. And James is showing me now while I'll speak how to find it. So here you are. If you go to the website, then uh, right. you click quick, market sorry. information. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So uh, it's uh, the promising niche markets. You find the food tourism report along with other interesting reports like adventure and bird watching. So I invite you all to take a look there. I also like to invite you for the 2nd of November. There is another CBI uh, webinar on uh, walking tourism, presenting also the recently published uh, fact sheet on walking tourism. Um, so uh, you can register also via the CBI website uh, and then you click on events. Good. Events. That'll ah, be all, yes. James. Give it back to you. Okay, good. That's events. They are the CBI website. Excellent. Uh, I apologize for that, everybody. That was. Um, unscripted but <laughs> anyway thank you Jeanette uh, please do check out the CBI website cbi.eu forward slash tourism and I would recommend everyone go in there do check out certainly uh, the report that today's session was based on and plenty of the others There's lots in there various niches different sectors all sorts of stuff that's very useful for everyone right that's it for today uh, a reminder as Jeanette said, we are going to be here again next week. That's Tuesday, November the 2nd at 10 a.m. Central European time. That's still GMT plus one. Uh, when we'll be looking at another niche tourism market uh, and exploring the opportunities in walking tourism. So that means we'll be looking at everything from jungle treks to high altitude hiking and plenty more. We have a, 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 another great panel of experts who are going to be taking us through that. And we hope to see you there. Um, a recording of today's session and the slides are going to be sent to you, and that will include the link to register for this. Or as Jeanette said, you can pop onto the CBI website to register for the uh, session as well. Just to repeat, please don't forget to visit the CBI website and look at all the reports that are on there, um, and particularly the food tourism reports. Very relevant for today. Um, I just finally, that just leaves me to thank everyone. I'd just firstly like to thank our panel, if they're still here. Are they still there or have they all left? Alison, anyone? I'm still here. Still here. Hey, you're all still here. Excellent. Yeah. Sorry, I've lost everyone. Well, oh, thanks there you very go. much, right. everybody. Let's just say a massive thank you to Alison Berg. Thank you to Tony Thorne, who stayed up very late in Australia for us. And thank you once again to Esther. You all been fantastic today. Very useful. And uh, yeah, thank you for coming along. I'd also like to say a big thank you to Jeanette and the team at CBI for arranging these webinars and doing all the hard work behind the scenes. And a massive thank you, of course, to all of you who've attended and participated today. Uh, I hope you've had as much fun as we did. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope it's been useful. I hope you do literally have some food for thought to take away. Hopefully it's not monkey. <laughs> I'm still shocked by that. But thank you all for joining us. 
have an amazing day everybody and we will see you next time so uh goodbye bye everybody. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. goodbye bye see you next time